infectious diseases are on the rise. Since 1980, we've witnessed the emergence of HIV AIDS, SARS, chikungunya virus, and Ebola. Despite huge advances in vaccines and therapeutics, the burden of infectious diseases continues to rise. Between 1980 and 1992, the mortality rate due to infectious diseases increased by 58% in the United States. In 2000, it was declared that measles had been eliminated from this country. But somehow last year, there were 644 cases of this disease. And for the last year for which we have data worldwide, 2013, it's estimated that 145,000 people died of this preventable illness. So, infectious disease is serious business, but I have with me something a little less serious. The game. Jenga. What does Jenga have to do with the problems of infectious disease? To illustrate, I want to call on the Drake family Jenga champion. So, this is my eight-year-old daughter, Tessa. Now, while I'm trying to explain my idea to you, what you can think of as the Jenga theory of emerging diseases, Tessa and I, at the same time, are going to try and demonstrate it. The way Jenga works is a player takes a block from the lower portion of the tower and has to place it on the top. And what this does is it destabilizes the tower even as it builds it up higher until eventually the whole thing comes crashing down. Tessa, do you want to go ahead and take the first turn? So Jenga, like infectious diseases, basically have just two ways of being, two alternative stable states. Now, now despite, despite the fact, fact that there's all kinds of lots of different working parts, parts, lots of different pieces, there's still basically two fundamental ways in which the system can exist. In measles, for instance, we can have endemic disease in a country, or we can have elimination. In Jenga, we can have a coherent tower, standing tall on the table, or just a pile of blocks. And because there are just two possible situations, we call such systems bistable. Now, I'm very interested, I'm very interested in how we switch between these two different stable states. Um, so, as a biologist, I did what comes natural. I did some experiments. Maybe not the experiments you have in mind. Experiments that look like this. Yeah. We played Jenga. Oh, dear. And the reason we played Jenga is because we wanted to learn about a phenomenon called critical slowing down. But before I tell you about critical slowing down, it might be helpful to tell you about an earlier TED talk. In February of 2006, Larry Brilliant was given the TED Prize. Now, in the 1970s, Brilliant was a medical officer with the World Health Organization's Smallpox Eradication Program. He was one of the medical doctors that helped to oversee the complete elimination of smallpox in the wild. And his talk, called One Wish to Change the World, he explored the idea of a system, a system for early detection and early response of emerging infectious diseases. See, what Brilliant knows is that some future disease, if it has the deadliness of Ebola mixed together with the transmissibility of flu, or the infectiousness of tularemia, that could be just devastating to humanity. 
And so, Brilliant repeated in his talk as a kind of mantra, early detection, early response. This is what we need to do, said Brilliant. Early detection, early response. This is how we eliminated smallpox. Early detection, early response. This is what GFIN, the Global Public Health Intelligence Network, was set up to do. Early detection and early response. But, but I, wonder I wonder if we can, can do better. better. You, you see, early, early detection and early response is always a reaction to something. To something. It's, it's always the response to an event that has already occurred. <laughs> I think I found one. But I wonder if we can do better than being reactive. I wonder if we can be proactive. I wonder if there's a way that we can do some kind of forecasting, predicting emerging infectious diseases before they occur. And that's what brings me back to critical slowing down. You see, all biostable systems, including this one, which I can tell you is increasingly unstable, all bistable systems have some commonalities. And those commonalities can be represented by this picture. This is called a potential diagram. And on the horizontal axis, we have some measurement of the state of the system. Maybe it's the orientation of a Jenga tower. Maybe it's the prevalence of an infectious disease in a society. And the current state of the system is represented by the location of the red ball, which inherently has the tendency to roll downhill. Now, what causes this ball to roll downhill, that is different from one system to the next. It depends on the particular rules of that system. Now, those, those rules vary from system to system. But, but all stable systems, all, all bistable systems must have some such rules. If they don't, they wouldn't be bistable systems. I told you, she's the champ. And so what we're interested in is how you can get switching from one of these stable states to the other. Now, if, if the, the ball, ball represents, represents the, uh, the, the location of the system, some kind of measurement, well, well that, that location is going to change a little bit from time to time. And, and those changes are going to be reflected in fluctuations in our measurement of the system. So, so that ball is mo moving around a little bit in the bottom of one of those potential wells. And every so often, it might get jostled pretty hard, hard enough to move up over that hill and get pushed into the other stable system. Or the other stable... You can't play the game and talk at the same time. Oh, I found one. Right, so one of these, one of these times the ball gets jostled, it gets pushed up over that, over that hill into the other stable condition. That's one of the ways that we can get switching between the alternative stable states. But there's another way, and it's the other way that happens in Jenga and in emerging infectious diseases. You see, in this other way, what happens if the rules are changing? I'm not sure, but that might be against the ordinary rules of Jenga. And so if the rules are changing, well, that's what happens, isn't it? In all of these situations, 
Finally, the tower comes crashing down. Maybe we see it, maybe we don't, but by the time we see it, there's nothing we can do. You are awesome. All right, it's great that the animation just started over. So, the system is fluctuating in one of these potential wells. And what happens, because the rules are changing, the potential surface gets deformed. And as it's getting deformed, we lose the stability of one of the, of the stable conditions. In this case, the, the case that doesn't, the, the spillover condition. And when that happens, inevitably, the ball has to roll down into the alternative stable state. Okay, but look at this. See what happens when we slow down the deformation. Originally, when the, when the ball's in the original state, all we have is a small wobble. But just before it goes past that tipping point, that small wobble turns into a massive seesaw from side to side. And those large fluctuations, that's what we're looking for. That's the phenomenon of critical slowing down. Now, it's called critical slowing down, critical because it happens just before we approach that tipping point. And that tipping point is what scientists call a critical point. Slowing down, because the time that it would take to come to rest again in that the original uh, potential well gets longer and longer as the sides of the potential well become less and less steep. So this is what we realized. Since emerging infectious diseases are like other bistable systems, if there was some way that we could measure these fluctuations, maybe we could harness that information to develop early warning systems for emerging infectious diseases. The problem is, how are we going to be able to develop our systems? We can't go out and collect data on all emerging diseases in nature. After all, that's what GFIN is trying to do. But GFIN is only reactive. GFIN is not going to be able to provide us all of the data we need to develop our systems. So I was explaining this idea, the whole potential diagram and critical slowing down thing to one of my students, a guy called Vic. Vic was really trying to wrap his head around this. And he said, so it's like Jenga, right? Just before the game's over and the tower's about to topple, it starts to make a really big wobble. Well, we saw that today, didn't we? So yeah, that's exactly it. And that was our light bulb moment. Here we had a system that we could make to go through the collapse as often as we want. We could make it happen over and over again. Sure, the configuration of blocks is going to be different each time. The particular nudge that causes it to fall over, that's going to be different each time. But, just like an emerging infectious disease, we know that we're going to see that increasing destability, and we're going to see the inevitable collapse. So what do you guess we did? We started to play Jenga. We started to think about, how do you measure Jenga? And in Jenga, that wobble, those are going to look like deviations from center. Now, we found it difficult to measure those deviations from center. It was hard to tell the difference between fluctuations that were due to the increasing inherent wobbliness of the tower. That's the critical slowing down that we were looking for. To distinguish those from, well, maybe I probed a little bit too hard looking for a loose block, or I replaced it with too much force on the top. So what did we do? Well, we started playing on a shaker table that we repurposed from the microbiology lab. By taking the tower for a spin after each turn, we were able to measure a wobble in a way that was consistently induced with every turn. And so we took a digital camera, we bolted it to the ceiling, we pasted some fluorescent dots on the blocks because we could see these in the, uh, in the videotape. We wrote some computer programs that could then analyze that tape collect the position of those dots, and measure the wobble of the tower. And we developed the statistical algorithms needed for processing that data, and we played Jenga, and we collected data doing the impossible, collecting data on systems that are about to go through a tipping point without having to actually observe all those emerging infectious diseases out in nature. And an interesting thing happened. As this figure shows, our data show that we were able to predict the approach to the tipping point. What you see here is the magnitude of the wobble as we calculated it against each turn in a real game of Jenga. 
And as it crosses the dashed line, that's when it crosses the tipping point and falls over. So success, right? We see here the slow approach to the tipping point, and we could look at these data and predict it would be between turns six and seven that the tower would fall over, and we would have gotten the answer exactly right. But that's not all that's here. You see, I've come to think of Jenga also as a metaphor for social life and for the effects of sociality on disease emergence. The sequence of steps in the game reflect individual actions, personal decisions, that only in aggregate build up to determine the stability of the system. And what's more, the actions that I take, the personal decisions that I make, may be alternately magnified or muffled by the actions taken by other players. The approach to the critical point isn't necessarily smooth. It moves in steps, sometimes barely perceptible, sometimes quite substantial. And so, as scientists, we're still learning from our games of Jenga. We're learning technically how to measure that wobble, but its lessons are not only for us. As we've seen, Jenga is a metaphor for collective action, and there are few realms in which the deliberateness and intentionality and coordination of collective action are more important than in public health. And in fact, it's because we're all connected that we need to go beyond systems for early detection and early response. These are, after all, primarily systems for collecting measurements, but instead, we need to develop systems and make predictions. Thank you.